I come closer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session. Um, we're here today as a collaborative effort um, between UMass Boston School for Global Inclusion and Social Development, Aid Data, the Panetta Foundation for Youth, People with Disability Australia, and Disability and Global Development Network of Canada. And um, one of the things with side events at this session is that there was so much that people wanted to present here that we are attempting a collaboration between um, two groups to focus on foreign aid and inclusion of people with disabilities. So for the first section of this presentation, I'll be presenting our research on behalf of UMass Boston and Aid Data. And the title of the study, if we could do the slides up on the screen, is No One Left Behind, Tracking Aid for Vulnerable Populations. And this was a collaborative effort. Uh, there's four of us here today, but we're a much larger team. And so my name is Valerie Carr. I'm a professor at UMass Boston. And I worked with three PhD students who were fortunate enough to have here today. Uh, we had Raina Verbeck, Ashley Coates, and Kelly Bruscard. Um, and we're all from the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development in Boston. In addition, we had a collaborative partner from Aid Data, which is at the College of William and Mary. And one of the missions of Aid Data is transparency in international development. And I think they were a key cornerstone from UMass focusing on disability and inclusion and working with a mainstream organization that focused on development, transparency, and data and coming together to work on how do we make uh, information and data around investment in disability and inclusive within development portfolios, um, easily understandable, trackable, and how do we come up with a methodology to do that? And so it was very much a collaborative effort. Today we're gonna go over the background and context, purpose, methods, results, conclusions, and next steps. And then that'll be followed by a discussion and feedback um, from additional panelists. So the first question we really had and we came together is how do we track funding and commitments for the SDGs? And how do we track this according to vulnerable populations? How do we come up with a research methodology that is not only robust um, and valid, but also easy for policymakers to understand and easy for development agencies to make decisions based off of this data so that we can direct more funding and more commitments to inclusive practice. And so I'm going to pass it over to Raina Verbeck for an overview of the study. Okay, so one of the first and one of the most important sections of our program was to develop a coherent methodology. We saw that a methodology is needed for, could we bring the slides back up? Thank you. <laughs> Um, we're looking for ways to bring together how we track financing from different sources um, towards inclusion for people with disabilities. So looking at the SDGs and breaking them down in ways that we can create visualizations and see trends and gaps and any shortfalls at different levels, be it national, international, or subnational, um, where we're seeing where the financing is going from development to people with disabilities. So the purpose of this study comes from the root of the no one left behind mantra. And to that end, we analyzed the development projects portfolios of two different partners, one multilateral agency, in this case the World Bank, and one bilateral agency, the Department for International Development. The methodology was one of the most complex and maybe one of the most interesting parts of the process. We had a joint transdisciplinary team trainings. We had to physically in the room bring together researchers from our aid data partners and from UMass Boston to develop a definition of disability that we could understand as we went through projects together in order to have a conversation about disability and about development around disability that we made sure that each side was understanding what the other one was seeing in the projects. So to that end, we developed a shared definition of disability and keywords to go along with that definition, and then a set of attributes and codes. 
So the attributes included social versus medical approaches to disability, gender, natural versus acquired, and um, humanitarian. And the codes were all broken down from the SDGs goals and targets, and we looked specifically at the SDGs that explicitly mentioned people with disabilities, also taking in the other SDGs. So um, on the screen you can see there's just uh, an example of how the coding process worked to develop the methodology. So in, in very tiny letters, unfortunately, at the top is um, goal eight of the SDGs, and then you'll see the indicators broken down on the side. And for sample codes, we had to come up with possible scenarios that you might see in a development project that would lead to a code or lead us to flag a project as possibly involving people with disabilities. So you can e see examples, for instance, sustainable tourism that focus on accessibility for people with disabilities. So to make it more real and more tangible for our partners and to be able to work together in a meaningful way, we developed these example codes. Um, after that, we went through each of the documents. Um, for the World Bank, we reviewed the project appraisal documents, integrated safeguard data sheets, project information documents, and project proposals, and project completion reports and summaries when we were looking at the different projects. So slightly different documents, but we're looking for similar um, keywords and codes. And we went through a coding process that went from individual coding to group coding, and then intercoder reliability checks and arbitration if there were disagreements or um, differences among the coding from the coders. We'd go through an arbitration round to make sure that we've reached intercoder reliability. And just a quick mention on this is that I think it's very important to realize that Aid Data's group had no background in disability. So we were working on how do we how can we be focused enough in our definition of these codes so that people who have no experience in disability in development agencies would be able to code and look at their portfolios in the same way that we who might have a background and understand what inclusive practice looks like. And so that's why you'll see that we had individual group and then arbitration rounds because we had a lot of back and forth and kind of how do we explain it? How, what does inclusion look like in real life? All right, so I am going to go over the World Bank initial results and analysis. And the first thing that I would like to mention is that all of these findings are preliminary. And this is a pilot study. So I just keep that in mind as we're going through the data. And um, we'd like to engage in a, in a conversation afterwards. So that's, that's what the purpose of this is. So first of all, we looked at the whole World Bank portfolio and then all of the active projects that they had online. And what we coded were 2% of those projects. So that was the inclusive projects of all of World Bank's uh, portfolio, active portfolio. The average number of codes that were given, so if we saw a project in education and it met three indicators, those are each of the codes that we're giving, and we gave, on average, three to each project that we coded. And this is how it broke down by SDG. First, you can see that SDG 17 was coded most often at 36%. And we would expect to see this because partnerships is something that's going to go along with a lot of different projects in a lot of different areas. The next one is SDG 4 in education at 20%, and then followed by SDG 1, poverty, at 15%. And the top 10 most frequently used codes are 1.3, so that is the uh, national social protection systems. So we saw a lot of social protection systems in all of the World Bank's portfolio. After talking with the World Bank, we found that's because the uh, inclusive practices were housed under the social protection um, group for a long time. So we saw a lot more inclusive practices within the social protections. Uh, and then you have 17.18, which is capacity building, which is one of the partnership codes. And next is 17.16, which is knowledge sharing in partnership. 
The top 10 least frequently used codes fell under five different goals of the SDGs, the first being 16, prevention of violence, access to justice, and participatory decision making. Then SDG 3, which is substance abuse and reproductive health, and SDG 11, inclusive settlement planning and access to public spaces. Eight, labor rights, access to banking, sustainable tourism. And lastly, SDG 2, which is food security. These all had one or less codes. So what does this mean? Um, so you saw a lot of data and graphs, and we can share these slides afterwards, but really the importance is where is World Bank focused, and then what could be improved, or kind of where is there a lack of focus where they might need to work with different divisions within the bank um, to raise awareness. So as Callie mentioned, one of the things we saw was this um, abundance of projects that included people with disabilities within social protection. And the reason why we see social protection and data and technical assistance together a lot is because those go hand in hand. If you're going to have a social protection program or a social assistance program, you need to adequately know how many people you have. You have prevalence studies around disability. You need to be able to register at a government level people with disabilities within your country. And then they need to receive the actual assistance you're offering. And so we see an abundance of that. But after briefing the World Bank, we found out that's because they naturally were housed within social protection. And so one of the questions we had was, is there an angle or is there a lean towards protection versus participation? And how does that align with the kind of the CRPD and active participation of people with disabilities within development agencies? Um, so we saw a little bit in education and health and housing, but what we didn't see is um, political participation. So violence pre uh, prevention, uh, legal recognition of legal identity, um, access to justice. We also didn't see a lot of projects that looked at labor rights and kind of access to work and how to be an economic contributor to society uh, versus provision of aid and social assistance. And um, we also saw a focus on, and this is natural, and I think everyone in the room would understand this, access to primary education, but really a lack of access to higher education opportunities. So again, if you get back to the core takeaways of why we want to do this type of work is that we went and briefed the World Bank a few months ago about this and had a wonderful conversation is that they, they knew kind of naturally that some of these areas were lacking because they hadn't gotten to different groups to really advocate about inclusive practices. Um, but it's data, it's hard and concrete data on where there's gaps in the development portfolio and where we might be more inclusive. So some of our follow-up here after this type of briefing is to go and brief um, kind of people who are working in labor rights and, and work programs about disability inclusion and the way people with disabilities would be included in those types of projects. So this was World Bank and then now we're going to take you to a bilateral agency. We uh, did preliminary analysis of DFID's portfolio. Callie? So the first thing that you're going to see with the DFID projects is that of their active portfolio, which was 672 at the time that we looked at this and our our remark to that is that the DFID portfolio is ever being updated. And so at this date, there are going to be more projects on their website than there were when we did this. So this is a, just a quick snapshot in time. But 11, we coded overall 11% of the projects that were online at that time. The average number of codes that we saw in the DFID projects were 2.4, so just a few less, mostly one, two, or three codes on all of the projects, a few less than World Bank. And overall, as we see, the goals that they contributed to are a little bit different. So the most is SDG 17 with partnerships and data, which we would again expect to see as this is uh, partners with a lot of other goals. But then we had SDG 4, which is education, at 25%, SDG 3, health, at 18%, and then SDG 16, peace and justice, at 14%. So it was exciting to see some of those other SDGs in their portfolio. The most frequently used codes are somewhat similar to World Bank, with 17.17 .17 being up in the top three, which is the in-country knowledge sharing. And then 4.7, which is uh, an access to all education. And then 17.16, which is, again, capacity building. 
The three least frequently used codes are under food security, inclusive settlement, planning, and access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable modern energy. So the difference, I think, between DFID and World Bank is that we saw, again, a surprising and a welcome uh, project portfolio around peace and justice and kind of more of a participatory practice. A few other things to consider is that DFID portfolio, um, again, doesn't have as much as publicly available data. So this is not a full representation of their portfolio. But they also have a lot... Um, I guess their, their investment portfolio, how much they invest in each of these projects. These projects financially are much smaller and more concrete in their focus. So you'll see they're in the areas of education, health, very specific projects. Um, and then again, when we look at the data, we know that naturally many countries around the world are asking for, from the disability community and from donors, for capacity building services because they simply don't know how to create an inclusive education system or the best approach for it or how to set up a social assistance program. Or they do know how, but they need the funding to support that program. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that capacity building again within DFID's portfolio. Um, the, the one thing we've seen that was very different than the bank is that there was, we didn't see a lot in poverty reduction for people with disabilities and their strategies. Uh, at this time, we don't have, we have not briefed DFID on the data, uh, which we are going to be. They're very interested in looking at the data. And uh, one of the things that's really great about uh, being in the disability community is that we see each other a lot. And uh, they said, well, could you tell us what we're doing? We, can't, we don't know what we're doing. And, and that was very interesting to hear because it was that these disability clusters within donor agencies are very small. So if you look at World Bank, it's Charlotte. You know, there's one person in there. They have a very small team. The same thing with DFID. It was, they have a much more robust policy and planning section. Um, they have a disability strategy. They're looking at implementation. But they still don't have the bandwidth and the capacity within the agency to look at what they're doing and how to make decisions about what they're doing to focus in other areas. And so what I found very welcome is that you know, our type of research is just about data. It's not about criticizing. It's about more informed decision-making within these agencies, and I think that's important to point out. Um, I'd already talked about protection and, and participation, but the other area we really wanted to look at is that we analyze the project proposals, and if anyone's a researcher in here, I want to know what they're actually doing. Like, did they end up doing what they said they were going to be doing? And so for that, we looked at the results framework analysis for World Bank. And so those 52 projects that we could code as being including people with disabilities, I wanted to know not only did they propose inclusion, but did they hold themselves accountable for inclusion? And were there outcomes that were disability related? And so World Bank was the only organization that we found that had the outcomes publicly available. And so we were able to look at the implementation and status reports and the project appraisal documentation um, to look at what outcomes they had within these 52 projects. So two other things came to light. One is um, we know there's a twin track approach to disability, right? And so we have the disability specific projects were aimed specifically for people with disabilities. And then we had larger development projects within our portfolio that included people with disabilities. And so we see that we had a smaller amount of disability specific, but it's definitely very interest or important to note that obviously we're gonna see outcome measures in those projects because their only population is reaching people with disabilities. And so when we look at the inclusive projects, um, do we see the same outcomes and accountability within that? And the short answer is no, we don't see the same level of accountability. So out of those 52 projects, only 15 projects, 29%, had disability-specific targets or outcome measures. And then when you farther break it down, 40% of those projects, so six out of those 15 projects, didn't report any data so they might have had a measure, but they didn't report the data at the end, even though they were completed, or they showed no progress for reaching people with disabilities. Um, and then the rest either met or exceeded, so four of those projects met or exceeded those goals, and those were disability-specific projects, and five of those projects had some progress towards meeting those goals. And so what I was interested in knowing is, what do the goals look like? How are they holding themselves accountable? So these are examples of some of the results indicators. And so general goals included, we had a state disability policy developed, adopted, or implemented. Uh, we created a registry of people with disabilities. Um, we moved 
vulnerable children and adults from institutions to family type care environments. And these, it's important to note, are inclusive projects, so they had broader outcome measures. Education, so we enrolled more children with special needs. That's one area where they had an outcome measure. Or we, this was an interesting goal, is that we reduced the number of cash transfers by increasing the number of people who were in, enrolled in a job brokerage program. So we had more people enter a productive workforce so they didn't have to have cash benefit transfers. And then we also had disability specific projects where we had a lot of social protection, so it's a number of people that participated in the program, or we had a health program that focused on rehabilitation. Or we had teachers trained in inclusive education, enrollment of children with disabilities in schools, a national strategy for inclusive education adopted and prepared, or the number of people who not only received an employment training, but actually completed the employment training and retained employment six months post the project. So as a researcher or someone who's looking at outcome measures, I like to see that you have the, not only did you participate, but you finished, you completed, and then six months later, we still have a level of attainment within that. So if I look at an outcome measure, I would like to see that as high as well for me to deem a project as being successful. And so I'm going to pass it over to Ashley now because we are also interested in not only the numbers, like how many were inclusive, but were they good examples of inclusive practice and how do we learn from those practices? Ashley? Great. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so I think one of the things that might be helpful for some of you in this room is that you may actually be able to give us some feedback in terms of qualitative because a lot of you are working on the ground and you're, you're collaborating with partners in your own home countries around successful projects. And so one of our goal from a research perspective was to take a look at some of the projects that we did code as being inclusive of persons with disabilities and pull out some of those key indicators and some of those things that really make that project successful and make it something that we would want to share with others so that they could perhaps mirror some of those those things that are happening um, on the ground. So what we did is we took a random sample of 12 of the 52 projects and we went through three rounds of individual coding, similar to how we did in the quantitative analysis. And then we also used um, a team review to try and help discern some of the emerging themes that were happening. And I think one of the things that's really important for us to, to acknowledge is that disability in itself can be pretty complex to define. And I think for those of you that's, that have been here throughout the day, you really understand that depending on who you're talking to and what you're talking about, disability has a really different voice and a different lens sometimes. And so for us, it was really important to try and identify what those um, what those key indicators were, what those things that you consistently see are that are going to support the disability community in reaching some of the goals. And CRPD talks about um, disability being an evolving concept. And so the qualitative analysis was much more of an evolving concept than the quantitative. In the quantitative, we were really just looking for keywords and projects and what was going on. But as we looked qualitatively, we really wanted to try and understand what it is that makes a project successful in terms of having outcomes and, and things that are supporting persons with disabilities on the ground. So we reviewed the project objectives, the components, and where available program indicators. So we're looking at the same things in the qualitative data that we were from a quantitative perspective. But again, we were just kind of changing our lens a little bit. And what we came up with were some core indicators for inclusive development. So if you were to, um, I would invite you all to go ahead and read all of those project documents. Um, if you were going to go through them yourselves and try and identify some projects that really were successful for persons with disabilities, we came up with these core indicators. The first being participatory. Do these projects include individuals with disabilities beyond just naming them as a vulnerable group? The second being partnerships. We know that um, one of the, the most important things for success is having individuals who understand the community um, to be on the ground and working with them. So are there collaborative efforts happening with CBOs or NGOs, medical providers? And then what are they doing to kind of monitor and evaluate the progress 
of these projects. Because a lot of times what we find is that they, sometimes we have the best of intentions, but when we get out there, how are we checking to make sure that those things are working? And I know one of the biggest issues for um, the World Bank, and Charlotte actually just mentioned it again in the, the session that we were just in, that disability desegregated data is so important, and it's something that's really lacking. So how are these projects working to understand and collect data about persons with disabilities? And then the last um, one of the core indicators is communication. And I think communication is important because it's not just about how are we communicating the, the progress of the project or the, um, the data points of the project, but more so how are we including people with disabilities in the work that we're doing? And how are we communicating to them to say, hey, guess what? This is what we're doing here, and we'd like you to be part of it. And as I, I mentioned before, this process was really an evolution. And what we tried to do is individually look at all of these projects from our own backgrounds and our own disability lenses and pull out some of those core indicators. And then what we did is we sat down together and we really tried to use the, that participatory model to collaborate and to identify maybe some other things that we might not have thought of. And what we came up with is a list of secondary indicators um, that really identify solid projects of inclusive develop that demonstrate inclu inclusive development. And those are projects that have a strong definition um, of persons with disabilities. We noticed quite a bit that they use, um, in the projects we see a lot of vulnerable populations, but most of the time they're not specifically identifying persons with disabilities as a vulnerable population, which makes it very difficult to track whether or not the aid is actually supporting that community. So does it have a very specific, explicit definition of disability um, or persons with disabilities? as a target population. And then how do they identify accessibility? And in that regard, it could be accessibility from an information standpoint, um, assistive devices, or it could be physical accessibility or accessibility to information. And then capacity building, that's something that I've also heard quite a bit throughout the day today is that we really need to work to make sure that we are empowering our human capital in, in countries to be able to support folks with the development dollars that we have. And so that's what we're looking for from a capacity building standpoint. And then lastly, we'd like to figure out projects that have some policy implications. So what are they doing to help be able to um, pass on that information to others that can inform policy on the ground and, and can help decision makers in terms of um, projects and things that are going to support the disability community. So just some key takeaways. Some key takeaways from the data is, uh, again, some snapshots is that World Bank's portfolio, their active project portfolio, we only found that 2% of it included people with disabilities. Um, DFID's available portfolio, and this is very important to note, it's only publicly available data, is 11% of their available project portfolio. Um, like Ashley mentioned, that if the project only mentioned vulnerable populations, it was a very good indicator that it probably didn't include people with disabilities in the end, or it didn't include them in any other spot. Um, because you could call vulnerable as all populations that are vulnerable, and then you can move on with the project without any outcome measures or specific mention of disability. So those projects in the end were not coded as inclusive um, because of the vagueness of the definition. Uh, there was, again, that focus on protection versus participation in many of the projects, um, social assistance and protection. And I think some of that is perhaps our view on disability and where agencies need to invest, but other parts are this kind of, this is where we're starting, and, and it's an evolutionary process. So where do we start? You know, we start with the poorest of the poor. We need to get them immediate financial assistance, and then we can build more inclusive education systems. And it's very easy to kind of roll out a social assistance program, but changing an entire education system and retraining and developing a, a professional elite of people who can work in this area takes a long time. So you'll see that there's a less of an investment. So we're not sure, and those are questions we're debating, is that um, an ethos, you know, like that that's how we view people with disabilities, or is it just the, the timeline and trajectory that development agencies are getting requests from uh, countries? The other thing that it's important to, to mention is that 
These projects, you don't know if they're originated and the impetus is from the countryside or the agency side. So we talk a lot about these are development agencies and their mission and where they're investing. Um, but a lot of times that's a country that approaches an agency and asks for funding in specific areas. And it's very dependent on the country itself. We had recommendations, of course, uh, you know, with the World Bank just concluding their negotiations on the safeguards is including people with disabilities as a specific population, developing policies around people with disabilities. We saw a difference between the bank and DFID, DFID having a specific policy and platform on disability, whereas the bank is continuing to develop in that area. And actually, as we're doing the study, you can tell it's real time. <laughs> as we're doing the study, they're publishing more and more on their website and disability specific information but it's very much evolving. Um, expand the use of a disability as a tag for project for better tracking. So when we look at just as a data management system, uh, disability is not a tag within these portfolios, so it's not easy for the people themselves to pull out those projects and identify where they're working with this community. We want to expand the study to include additional vulnerable groups. So when you look at a methodology such as this in SDGs and are we achieving the SDGs or are we funding achievement of the SDGs, we really want to be able to look at all populations, including women and children and ethnic minorities. Um, one of the, the pieces of feedback we got from the bank is, well, how much money? So what percentage of the budget is actually going for it? And we weren't able to do this from the project documentation we had. So you could have a $100 million project and maybe, you know, 0.05% went into disability inclusion or accessibility. And once you can kind of narrow down or have a mandate to break down budgets with an aim at inclusion, you'd be able to say how much are we investing in this area and inclusion. Um, right now that's not possible due to the fact that there's no tagging, there's no disaggregation of data, and budgets aren't broken down in that manner. So that's an area of interest. A few additional um, recommendations. We're looking to develop a toolkit for best practice. So we had started the qualitative analysis of these projects, um, but on the ground, what do they look like? What is good practice inclusive development? Uh, make recommendations for improvement of current projects based on that. Another valuable piece of feedback we received from the bank was that the disability specific projects have really great outcome measures and goals. And one of the reasons we may not have seen progress on those outcomes is that on paper, those projects look really good, right? We're going to develop an entire inclusive education system for this entire country and we're going to fund it. And then when we got to those countries and when we talked to the bank is that they actually significantly had to change those projects because they didn't have the capacity on the ground to do that. So when we look at implementation of CRPD and these lofty goals within the CRPD, they're written in that manner. And then when we go to the implementation stage, the country itself doesn't have the resource, the intellectual resource or the on-the-ground resource to actually implement the goals of those projects. So they're approved, but they can't implement them. And so what we wanted to do is trace some of those I wouldn't call them failed projects because they're redesigned projects to say, well, to countries, are there starting points and where can we begin and what are areas where it's attain obtainable and we can move from there versus having projects that don't meet their goals and then just move on. Uh, we enjoyed working on a multidisciplinary team and I find that it's really important to work with people outside of the disability community and inside. Um, We've been presenting a lot of this data to people within the disability communities and DPOs to, to get feedback, of course, on the qualitative indicators and the methodology itself, but also just working with larger entities like Aid Data, who are interested in just data transparency, really helped us refine and focus our methodology. And then we had some limitations we've talked about. It's only a snapshot, and we want to be very clear about that. Uh, World Bank portfolio did not include any of the trust-funded projects, so these are just government-level projects because that's what's publicly available. DFID is uploading daily. When we first started the analysis, I think we had 48 projects to analyze, and by the time we got back onto the database, it was 672. Um, we're not sure, again, where the, the focus of the projects come from, whether they're country or development agency-driven. We need to look at a lot of these projects on the ground to have clarity. We're looking at documentation, what people write, and 
for example, World Bank is pages upon pages of documentation, but DFID, we would generally only see a couple paragraphs, a very brief mention of disability. So then how actually were they included or were these populations targeted? Did, were they recruited? Were they partners? We don't really know everything about the project based on a couple of paragraphs. And then we were looking at projects for direct inclusion, but obviously many development projects like water sanitation projects are inclusive of whole communities, and we weren't able to capture that. We're looking at specific targeted mention of these groups. So there are residual impacts, obviously, of development portfolios that would have a positive impact on people with disabilities. So uh, there's my email address and Aid Data's email address, and we'd like to hand it over to Steve Esty and to get feedback from not only the the group here today, but we have a few panelists who'd be providing input on kind of foreign investment and disability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. Okay, I'm with the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, the International Committee there. We had uh, made application to do a side event here at the UN around Article 32, but as a lot of folks are aware, many organizations wanted to have side events, so we were encouraged to try to collaborate. So Valerie and I contacted one another in advance of the meeting today, thought we might be able to collaborate on this side session. So what you're about to see is our attempt at collaboration. Let's hope it works, okay? I'd like to start out by saying thank you for this. It's been very instructive. Our hope is to provide just a quick reaction from myself in Canada and colleagues in Germany and Australia to what you've had to say and then open it up for discussion around the, around the room because we have people from a variety of backgrounds here and we want to hear from them. But I think for me, I can say, it's extremely interesting and timely what you're talking about. As our organization, the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, got involved in the whole work around negotiating the convention very much because of our concern about Canada's bilateral development assistance and its lack of attention to people with disabilities. Our organization, CCD, has been trying to advance this issue for many, many years without a lot of success. We thought that if we came and engaged on the CRPD and got a good article around development assistance in the CRPD, then magically something would happen. But what we've seen since we ratified the CRPD, at least in Canada, is that really hasn't been the case. It hasn't translated. The work on Article 32 hasn't yet translated into changing the way that our development agency does development, pays attention to people with disabilities. And in the discussion that I've had with folks at what used to be CEDA and is now Global Affairs Canada Development Assistance Branch, they have a very hard time getting their head around that. They say, well, sure, that sounds great. We'd love to be able to respond to this and to better live up to our obligations on Article 32, but what does that mean and how do we do that? So the work that you're doing here, I think, is very helpful for us. And in Canada right now, we're engaged in a process around reporting on the convention. And I see newly minted CRPD committee member from Kenya at the end of the row back there. Now, I'm hoping that our colleagues at the CRPD committee will start to engage on this. Because what we see if you look at Canada's state report on Article 32 as a couple of very general paragraphs about what we're doing. And now as we're trying to develop the shadow report around this, it's very challenging as well. But what you've spoken about here today begins to help us develop a framework that I think over time we'll be able to use in the reporting and shadow reporting process and hopefully build up some technical knowledge and jurisprudence from the committee around what it means to actually do inclusive development and engage on Article 32. So again, I'd like to say thank you and perhaps pass it to our friend colleagues from Germany to uh, provide a little response. Inviting me to give a response uh, and to uh, give some uh, reflections on this and some information about the uh, situation in uh, Germany. Uh, I'm director of Disability and Development Corporation. It's an NGO 
and together with other NGOs, we are engaged in um, development cooperation um, for 20 years. Um, since we had the convention and before we started to get um, more attention to the inclusion of uh, persons with disabilities. And I can say that um, after the, um, the convention has been adopted by the United Nations, the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development missioned a study uh, what it means for German development cooperation to, becoming, to become inclusive. Um, then we, um, this was followed up by some, some activities and since the year 2013 we have an action plan uh, which aims to make German development cooperation inclusive. This action plan um, is still ongoing. Um, it uh, includes a lot of measures at different levels and activities and um, um, I must say that um, we made progress in uh, Germany, although we are not there where we should be and we would like to be, and some um, uh, things need to be done. And we also found uh, one problem you mentioned at your, um, at your presentation, that we still have a problem to define um, how persons with disabilities are included in German development cooperation. And um, it's, uh, it's one of the measures which needs to be done and one of the tasks, and um, we are still working on it. But we, have, we really have the same situation that we cannot say how persons with disabilities are included. And if you would um, make the same procedure as you did with uh, World Bank or uh, DFID, I think, um, I'm not sure if you, got, if you would get the results which would reflect reality because we, we still lack a definition of what a real inclusive project is. And we need to define attributes uh, which, uh, which, are necessary, which, yeah, which are necessary for an for inclusive project. And um, what, what also plays a role um, in our discussion is that we uh, speak about, we want to implement a rights-based approach which takes into consideration uh, the um, principles of the UN Convention. And so that's not, not so easy. Uh, the, at, at the moment we have, if you would make, uh, coming back to, to, your, uh, you, to your study, um, you would find uh, uh, um, inclusive uh, projects or the mentioning of persons with disabilities in, in German projects, but um, it uh, also could, um, this could be projects which, could not, which, which uh, do not meet the, um, um, what, 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 what would be a human rights uh, project. And so uh, we have projects, for example, uh, which have a name inclusive, but if you look, look have a, take a clearer look at it, uh, they, yes, they support special schools and they, they support a segregation and, and therefore uh, this um, definition is, is really important. Um, but I'm, I'm look, looking forward that we will have progress on this. At the moment, this action plan is uh, under evaluation, and I, I think it's a really good um, thing that uh, this action plan will be external evaluated. And the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, we have um, the representative um, with us. Um, will develop the next um, action plan or strategy building on the results of this evaluation. And I think that's, um, that's a good um, effort. Yes, I think, um, may, yes, maybe um, concluding with one remark. Um, we, um, for, for, for years we are really, I, I think the, the problem is if you want to monitor what, what, what's happening in development cooperation, you need a system and you need a concept. And, and uh, what we're really lacking is that we cannot monitor it. And the question is, 
if it's uh, we have this um, um, this um, marker concern when uh, in the OECD um, statistics concerning gender, and the question uh, what would be if we wouldn't if we wouldn't need to work towards a marker concerning inclusion to make uh, monitoring easier. I, I think I will end at this, and um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Is that on? Mm -hmm. Hello. Yep, is that okay? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sam French. I'm from an organisation called People with Disability Australia. Wow. Um, what I had prepared has sort of just flown out the window, but not really. No. I, I, I just think it, um, your talk um, you, at, from both of you has brought up a lot of um, um, very relevant issues for, uh, for people in um, the development sector in Australia. But anyway, here we go. Um, Firstly, um, I th certainly the convention, the CRPD, has placed increased emphasis on the need for us to focus on international cooperation and, and disability inclusive development, is the term we use for it now. As Steve has said, um, having Article 32 in the convention hasn't miraculously just led to um, international cooperation being inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, my organisation is an organisation of and for people with disability, otherwise referred to in, in these areas as a DPO. And um, right from the very beginning when we were, we, we were developed, uh, were involved with developing the convention, we very um, firmly believed in the need for people with disabilities to be involved in the decision making processes at every level and in a very strong commitment for international cooperation. And back then uh, part of our role we saw as supporting our sister organisations in the Pacific to have a voice here. And unfortunately there's still a lack of presence of Pacific Island country leaders and the disabled persons organisations at these very important meetings. In fact, I'm not, I, I haven't actually noticed any Pacific government here as yet, but um, yeah, they, they, it's usually a very lo low turnout because of the resource issues. But um, coming back to our commitment, right from the start we lobbied for a Pacific voice of people with disability in the development of the convention. We were successful in getting a representative, John Saran, from Vanuatu to um, deliver the intervention around international cooperation. And uh, Steve was around during those days. I don't know, Steve, if you were there when John gave his um, presentation, but there, um, it was a very moving um, speech in that he stood alone as the only person from the Pacific Islands who had made it to New York. And um, it was the middle of winter and he was wearing a short sh sleeve shirt, so was, he made a big impression. Anyway, so um, for us we see international cooperation and in, including international development as at all levels. So it's, it's not just, um, people often think of uh, aid or organ development organisations or governments going in and, and supporting people um, to have development projects. We would see that in terms of the active participation of people with disability, it has to be at all levels from the village right up to the United Nations. And there are um, challenges. So coming back to um, Australia, where Australia sits, Australian, the Australian government is a well-respected international donor. Uh, we give lots of money out in our region and um, we actually had led um, in many ways around disability inclusive development. I'm just holding up here our latest development for all plan 2015 to 2020. It's a lovely plan, says lots of great things and, and we, have, we have a lot of regard for our government's efforts in that, in that area. Um, however, um, there is a lot, a long way to go. Certainly, monitoring. Absolutely agree with what um, you've already picked up about the need for outcome measurements, to have clear um, accountabilities built in, and so on. And our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade would acknowledge that they're still really um, 
working at making sure that we have clear indicators and key performance indicators and measurements. Um, from our perspective, it is about um, ensuring that the outcomes that are being measured and the ways that we measure development effectiveness is actually real for people with disabilities on the ground. That um, if you only look at social protection or income protection, it doesn't tell you anything about how, how many barriers to employment there are for people with disabilities. Um, the other thing I just wanted to pick up on, so, so absolutely agree, I think it's very exciting that some solid research has been done on how to measure aid effectiveness and development. But um, if you ask people with disabilities how effective something is, you wouldn't have trouble getting a response back. Mm -hmm. So I think the quality of is, data is inc incredibly important. Um, I'm sort of jumping all over the place here, but um, that's okay. <laughs> um, you say that it's important to really know, you may collect the data, but to know whether something is working on the ground. Again, it is it meaningful for people with disabilities in that community, in that country, in that region? Um, in our region, in the Pacific in particular, we have some very good st structures that have been set up that we, um, we highly support and we think may are a good model. One in particular I'll use uh, just as an example, the Pacific Disability Forum, which is a regional network of people with disability, is, uh, has been very effective and, um, at raising the voices of people with disability in our region and increasing their presence in development assistance. Um, as part of that, uh, what's been set up is a the disability was it DPO uh, Funds Committee? And that is also funded through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's money provided to Pacific DPOs for development, governance and project development um, activities. A lot of it's being focused around the CRPD. But instead of just providing those funds to a development agency or a government, a government body or directly administering them, what um, those funds are provided, are administered through the Pacific Disability Forum. We elect out of our DPO membership, and the Pacific Disability Forum is a membership organisation. So as DPOs, we elect uh, three or four representatives to sit on that committee. Australia, I, I was elected as one of those committee members. And uh, we, each year, we go through applications for funding. And we as DPOs assess applications by DPOs. And we think it's a very um, valuable model because it's we're making decisions about aid effectiveness and where money is going and where projects, the focus of projects, um, with our with our sister DPOs. So I think that's a really important model to look at, and we can work alongside those DPOs to support them and in, exchange information. And we we're all learning from this. I think the SDGs are going to be uh, very, they're very exciting for us. In Australia, domestic DPOs sit in a very strange land. Those DPOs such as my organisation, we um, see if we have a very active role and responsibility to be actively involved in international cooperation. It, that's not always clearly understood to development partners. And so even though we've got a lovely policy, we've got uh, even an Australian Disability and Development Consortium made up of disability and development agencies. We've got, um, we are a member of our Australian Council for International Development. We've got lots of structures, lots of good practices. CBM Australia is very active in, in disability inclusive development. Lots of activity, lots of focus. We still struggle to be recognised for what role do domestic DPOs have in international development. And um, I could, could go on at, at length about what that is, but I mean, apart from the fact, the lived experience of disability, it's um, having a DPO to DPO partnership arrangement. So that it's, it's not about having, although there's uh, um, much regard and appreciation and respect for the donor organisations and the development agencies that work with our DPOs, there is also a, a very big need for 
supporting DPO to DPO partnerships, resourcing us to come together and to work on and collaboratively uh, work collaboratively on projects such as we do with the Pacific Disability Funds Committee and the Pacific Disability Forum. But de international development and international cooperation is more than just um, money, as you well be aware. If we were to pick out one thing, if you were to ask a lot of d DPOs, people with disability, what's the key thing that you want uh, in order to ensure that development is accessible, accessible to you and um, you're going to v benefit from the outcomes of development efforts, it would be role in decision making. So if you've got people with disability at the table, to right from the very beginning, they're going to be in a position to talk about what decisions are important, what, what areas of, of decision making and development are important. And although we always, we're hearing more and more that that's going to happen and we want to monitor programs to ensure that people are involved in decision making, it often doesn't happen. We're often left outside of the rooms, not invited to the table. And as I say, giving resourcing and facilitating bringing DPO to D DPO partnerships together is um, a very, would, would be a benefit across the table. Um, so sort of jumping all over the place there, but I'll just finish, I think, um, with, an example of um, decision making in our region that has been very, very effective, and that's our Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. The um, so Pacific Island leaders, ministers who are involved in disability, come together every few years to have a meeting specifically on disability. Right from the start, they included their DPOs in those meetings, and being the Pacific, a large discuss, a large area of discussion in those meetings is around development. Australia and New Zealand are oddballs in there because we are developed. Um, but I think the interesting aspect of the SDGs is that they will require governments like Australia to not only look at the what it's doing internationally, but also to look inward and to be more and more accountable for um, bridging or marrying what they're doing internationally around development, disability inclusive development, as well as what they're doing internally. Um, so what um, the model I was just going to mention briefly is with the D Pacific Disability Ministers, they invited us to the table and um, at one point our minister at the time um, stood up and offered myself the chair and said, I, I give my chair to my DPO and walked out the door. And, and other ministers followed suit. But it was a very powerful thing to actually, in that very high level government forum, to say, you tell us what you want in development in this region. And as a group of DPOs, we developed what was the first Pacific regional strategy on disability, again, largely with a development aspect perspective. And um, that model might be very simple and um, straightforward in many ways, but it's still not happening. It's not happening here. Um, it's not hap it's to the extent it could be, and it's there is a lot more room that we could um, a, a lot more capacity to provide people with disability the opportunity to have direct um, decision making. Um, so I think look that's just to sum that up. I think um, we're all struggling with data collection to how to monitor how to ensure that it really is providing outcomes for people with disability. Even governments such as my own Australian government that is doing some great things around disability inclusive development and international cooperation, we still have a long way to go to support domestic DPOs and bring DPO to DPO partnerships into the, for, into the centre of disability inclusive development. But I think I'll just sub finish there. Okay, 
Thank you both very much, and thanks again to Valerie and colleagues. We have about 10, 15 minutes left in our session. I wonder if we might just open to the floor to some quick reactions. And I'd ask people, if they want to make an intervention, to keep it to a couple of minutes maximum so we can allow as many colleagues as possible the opportunity to share their views. Who's going to be first? Wonderful. Uh, I'm Maha Hilali. I'm from Egypt. I'm uh, originally from the... Uh, I, I, I had an NGO. I'm, I'm a parent of a young man with autism. And uh, now I'm on the National Council, so it's like semi-governmental. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have seen the presentation you did. and uh, I'm, I think it's very important when people are out of the field of disability who can look at it and tell us where there are gaps and where there are over uh, riding. And because as you said, you had to, had, uh, to have people look at it more than one time and have people uh, decide if you had all agreed like on the marking and the coding and that's very important. What's also I would suggest is to come out with a uh, um, recommendation of a tool that can be used then by international organizations to look at their own work and see which uh, goals are they working on for the SDGs, what's, uh, what's um, really working and not working, because as you said, or as other people talked about, is um, it's not, the KPIs are not always clear. Like what, what are the indicators, what have they really achieved? Um, there is always like vague areas. Uh, one, of, one of the things that's very important, as, as you said, uh, the lady DPO from Australia, is that it's very important to listen to the persons with disabilities. And this is why um, I work in the field of inclusive education. I studied inclusive education. And uh, UNESCO, when they started the, the Education for All, they had a committee, uh, CCNGO, which was the Consultant Committee for NGOs where they had the NGOs sit with the government's representatives and put together. And this was important because usually uh, UN organizations work with government uh, ministries and so on. So they don't really always know what is on the ground, what's in the field, because the ministry will always say what the ministry wants to be done. So it's very important to have such committees where then you can listen to the people from the field, people who have the needs, who can tell you, yes, this is what we need. This is, this is real and this will not really touch our life. Because for example, in inclusive education, all the money in Egypt, for example, that comes to the Ministry of Education does not work on inclusive education because they always say, uh, we can't do it now, it has to be postponed, let's put more money into special education and teacher training when actually the road to education reform is now inclusive education. So this is where I would recommend that also uh, international donors have to have, uh, by putting a structure and putting their own monitoring tool, that this is an indirect way of pushing the governments to uh, go for the SDGs and CRPDs uh, uh, through the SDG, because everyone now is committed to the SDG. And so they put the plan, and there is something that everyone agrees on, no, this is not correct, this is correct, we'll give you the money, we won't give you the money, and at the same time, make sure that the goals are being met. Sorry if I took more than the two minutes. Thank you very much. Anybody else have a comment or an observation? Great. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Renata Zanetti. I'm from Australia, having formerly worked in um, the development and disability inclusion section and ACFID once upon a time um, and Switzerland and I've um, been doing a lot of studies on inclusion and communication. My question is about the role of philanthropists in shaping the agenda and I know of course um, having the, in, the article in the convention makes a massive difference and the SDGs as you've said but what's the role of awards and is that something you can research more and see if there are case studies because one thing we did do in AusAid when it was then AusAid is create an internal 
approach to developing case studies to find out what were what was working. So it's less about the specific data, but at least you've got some practical examples. And that's something that I think would be wonderful. I'm no longer working for the government, so I can say this would be wonderful to have Australian DPOs work in partnership to develop as well. But awards and the role of getting philanthropists and others that are doing innovations in this space, I think we got a zero project award too. It would be great to hear your thoughts or if there's a, that's something you could incorporate into your research as well. Thank you. That's an interesting comment. Thank you. We might have time for one more across the way. Go ahead. Yeah, I th I th it's great to have this discussion because I think... Sorry, it's Cathy Aljorbe from CBM. It's great to have this discussion because um, I think we're all struggling with how we really look at monitoring and evaluation and evidencing change. And I think there's two things that the Article 32 and Development Corporation can do. On one level, yes, we need better quality of the actual development corporation aid that goes into countries. But then we also need stronger input by governments on the bilateral into getting data into core national statistics systems so we can actually evidence change longitudinally. So getting that data into household surveys that's disaggregated. So I think there's two levels of data that we need. And I think sometimes we struggle with who's doing what in how to effectively advocate. So I think one of the things for, uh, and as CBM, we're working in coalition with the other, in the other NGOs in Germany. We're also working with IDDC um, and IDA at looking at this issue. And I think there's also a question, there's also bilateral discussions between donors as well. So I think somehow uh, we need to bridge between academics, uh, practitioners on the ground, DPOs on the ground um, that are actually able to inform what really matters and how do we influence these. We don't want to almost, um, what's the expression, losing sight of the, uh, the wood, looking at the wood for the trees, looking, I can't remember that expression. Yes, you get, you get my idea anyway. Thank you for all those suggestions on that <laughs> analogy. But I think we've got to be really careful because we might get really good at looking at kind of micro level analysis of inclusion and miss the bigger picture that we actually don't have core data on the status of employment, um, uh, status of, uh, and, and the, is, those are the really big human rights violations. And I think the other key thing that we've been hearing over and over again in all these panels is intersectionality. So I want to say intersectionality, 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 because the compounding factors of how disability intersects with, with gender, different impairment groups, and actually looking at age, youth, as opposed to older people um, with disability, looking at indigenous people, LGBTI, a whole range and raft of reasons that people get excluded. And somehow we've also got to address that intersectionality because that's one of the worries that we're having with data sets that doesn't give. So we're almost celebrating that we've succeeded, but actually we really do. Everyone, we keep saying the same thing in all the panels. We need to look at who's being left behind. What is happening to deaf-blind people? What is happening to people with psychosocial disabilities or people with learning disabilities, people on the margins? And we do need to have a look at the rural-urban divide. So we have these data sets from donors, and you don't actually get a sense um, also. So I haven't got any solutions. I'm looking for them. Anyone wants to come talking? Anyone's got any answers? I would love to hear from the panel and anyone else that's got suggestions, because I think we're all struggling with it. And Thank we could you. do with the community practice asking these questions, regularly dialoguing, not yeah. waiting just once a year to meet up at cost, but it would be great if, if, if somebody could be doing regular webinars where we just kind of blog and share, hell, how do you do this? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm all up for having practical tools and sharing of resources on, on how we get our heads around this, because we haven't got time. The reality is if we're going to succeed in Agenda 2030, we have to hit the hardest groups first. Thank you. I think uh, Thank two you comments. Very much. I appreciate your Sorry, comments. can I have two Gallery. comments on that? Is uh, one is you're talking about granularity of data, and we did try to find granularity within our data sets. 
um, looking at project proposals, you don't see that a lot. And we had attributes for it, meaning we we're looking for, is it intellectual disabilities, physical, like are there specific groups that are being targeted more? And we couldn't find that because they're not tagged. So some of it is trying to push um, the donor agencies to tag and to code and to, to have more specific definitions so that we can look at that, I think is a good recommendation. And then based on everyone else's input, another area of research we want to pursue is a country level analysis. So private donors, bilaterals, multilaterals, what is all the funding that's coming into a government and then how do we look at it from the government up versus from a donor agency down? Is the perspective different? Does the data look different? And do the outcomes look different? So thank you. Okay, I think we're out of time here. I'm not sure there may be other people planning to use the room. Uh, go ahead, very, very quickly. No, I just wanted to build on, um, on the comment that was made on, on data. Um, I'm, I'm uh, Levin Bowens, I'm with the International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus. And, uh, and I'm wondering in how far programs are being skewed by, by the use of the, the, the methodology of, you, of the data that are used at this moment. Um, I, I represent people with a congenital disability, and, and I'm also involved in, in development programs in Eastern Africa and in, and in, uh, and in other countries, in uh, Peru. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's very difficult to get our programs into, into the, you know, the development cooperation because there, there is, you know, it's not a problem. And then we start monitoring at, 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 the, at the country level and we see that it is a problem. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can I invite you to pursue this directly with folks? We're over time and I think there's a fellow who had asked to make an intervention and we bypassed him a couple of times. So in fairness, I think I should yield the floor to him, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I'll be very brief. First of all, I'm very impressed about uh, with the, this discussion about international cooperation, especially I, coming from a developing nation like Tanzania, understand uh, the importance of international cooperation. I just wanted to add one thing that um, I think international cooperation should also involve more dialogue. It's not just the question of developing nations to say that they should consider disability in their development assistance, but it should also uh, involve more dialogue between the, in, well, when it comes to international assistance between the giver and the, the beneficiaries of those assistance, because that is the only way the international cooperation will, only, will also have meaningful cooperation. I'm, I'm giving two examples for that. In many developing nations, especially in Africa, you would realize that from the 2000 onwards, there have been a lot of policy reforms because most of the international cooperation or bilateral agreements included clauses of policy reforms. But despite all these policies, there are still bigger issues of inclusion. And as I said previously, we, with the problem of assistive devices, many companies in Africa wouldn't invest in production of assistive devices because they know that there is no market for that. And uh, the government would like to produce those, but they lack technology to do that. So my appeal here is that international cooperation should also involve the transfer of technology in making sure that developing nations can produce assisted devices, and in this way, it will galvanize the speed of inclusion. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. I think it's awfully appropriate to end our discussions here with a comment from the Global South. So thank you very kindly. Thanks, everyone, for a very interesting and rich discussion. Enjoy your evenings, get some rest, and we'll see you bright and early in the morning. <laughs>